Hi everybody. Uh, don't mind the crappy lighting here. This is just really quick. I want to come on. Talk about coincidence. No sooner did I put this up on the computer to uh, edit it, to put it up, that uh, Electroboom put out a video on, you guessed it, diodes. <laughs> and of course, as always, he did a spectacular job on it. So I would encourage you to go and watch that if you want to learn more about just some basics the buzzwords and things and quick definitions of different types of diodes. Now what I'm going to get into in this video is a lot more detailed about diodes as how they relate to our project that we're working on today. I also address a few things uh, at the beginning of the video concerning some comments that I had on previous videos in this series. So there's a ton of stuff in this video. I know I said that I was going to try to do all these videos and in one half uh, half an hour or less but this one uh, number one I got a lot of comments saying you really didn't want that uh, you wanted me to leave content in and you don't mind other things and second of all you can you can use the little slider bar we have technology today um, we're not watching a 16 millimeter film <laughs> <laughs> in a movie theater, you, you actually can fast forward now and you can pause things and come back later and watch the rest of it, or you know. So it really doesn't matter. So I'm going to put all the content up. I will edit a few things out, but most of it I'll put up. Good, bad, indifferent. Mistakes like I always make, I'll leave those in, everything. And uh, I'm going to get to work upstairs. But I just thought that was quite a coincidence that no sooner did I just upload the, all the footage that from this video that I did to edit it and Electroboom comes out with a very good diode video so I, I recommend you go watch him uh, certainly knows a lot more than I do about this stuff anyway off with the video hi everybody welcome back so before we get started with this part let me address a couple of comments uh, that I have repeatedly received in the last video. And that is namely the position of the light in reference to the fuse and the switch. Now I drew this this way very quickly to just show you that when you flip the switch the light comes on. However, in reality, I did not wire th this this way and I have been massively chastised by many of you <laughs> that you want to put the, the light on the other side of the fuse so that if the fuse blows, the light will not come on when you turn on the switch. So I will make this correction. and I will go up here and I'll say this is how it should be wired. And in fact, when I actually wired it, let's look at it, it is in fact wired that way. So look here is, the, here is the hot lead, that prong right there. And I, I did this on the, on the video where I wired this up, but I think some of you didn't catch it. So here's the prong coming in right here. There's this bus bar connected to it, and this is one side of the fuse. So that would represent this section right here. The fuse then goes across this way and ends up at this terminal down here. And this terminal leads with this white wire up to the light bulb. So you can see, in fact, when I wired it, it is, in fact, wired after the fuse. I just drew it incorrectly in my haste. Uh, so that is my fault, and therefore I hope that will correct any confusion there might be. Another question I got was, I had a couple comments. First of all, why did I not twist these mains wires? Uh, wouldn't it also help to cancel some hum? It probably could, but take, take a look at where this is all located. You can see the mains wires are down here in the corner and I have this little keeper holding them all together and this little cable tie and they all stay on this side of the transformer 
far away from any of the circuitry. So there's no danger of having any kind of interference there. The next thing was about wiring the, uh, having the filament windings next to the chassis. In this particular design, I do not believe we are going to have any kind of problems uh, with hum. With this being no next to the chassis, we're not going to have any capacitive coupling or anything like that. As a matter of fact, a lot of these lower end amplifiers like this don't even use twisted filament wires. They just run the two wires. Again, you have to remember, this is not a super high gain amplifier. This is not a guitar amplifier. This is an audio amplifier. And even though this does have a pentode uh, front end, this is not an extremely high gain amplifier. So again, we're not going to have to worry about those things. This is going to be just fine. And if it's not fine, we'll correct it. And I will stand corrected and I will tell you all <laughs> that I was wrong. But I think we're going to be okay. Uh, these wires, yes, I could have twisted them as well. But again, they're clear over here and I'm really not concerned about their location there. The other thing I didn't mention in the last video was I did punch two extra holes here. And you're going to see why I did that uh, later on. I'm also probably going to put fit the sides on before I get so many things in here that I can't, you know, can't get in there to, to put the screws in. So those couple of things. These terminals are going to be for our power supply. Remember, we're going to do point to point wiring. And I'm going to keep the power supply over here near the mains and everything out of the way. Uh, the high voltage power is going to be over here. And then all of our circuitry is going to be on this side of the amp. So we'll, we'll go more into this later on. But today, this video is going to be about diodes and rectifiers. Now previously, we learned about the power transformer, the mains transformer. And we have our mains power coming into it. And then we learned how a transformer can convert uh, one voltage to another or multiple other voltages. And in this case, this is taking my 120 volts mains power and it is stepping it up to about 230 or 240 volts, somewhere around there, for the high voltage part for the vacuum tubes. And it's also stepping the power down on a separate winding so that we can have the 6.3 volt filament windings to to drive the filaments of the x-ray of the tubes, x-ray tubes. Can you tell what I do for a living? So this actually generates those multiple voltages. And that's what we learned that that's what a transformer does. Now, the problem is we also learned that transformers need alternating current in order to, to run. And of course, we need direct current for our circuit. So the next challenge we have is we want to take the alternating currents that we've created through these powers, through this transformer, and we want to convert it into direct current. So that's where the rectifier or the diode comes into, into play. Okay, quick primer on diodes. A diode is a two element device, and it will direct or allow the flow of current in only one direction. What's that mean? Well, that means that in this case, if you see the little stripe, that's your cathode. And what it means is if you connect the positive and negative in one direction, if we put our positive here and then the current flows to the negative, that will allow the current to flow. If I turn the diode backwards and I put the positive here, it will block the flow of current. So what, what a diode's whole purpose in life is, is to only allow current to flow in one direction. And they usually will put a little marking on there so that you know what is the cathode and what is the anode side. Every diode has a cathode and an anode, and that signifies where your what direction the uh, current is going to flow. Now the schematic symbol for a diode is this. Just looks like an arrow 
with a line, a straight line across it. Now, if this straight line has some different shapes to it, it can signify different types of diodes that we're not going to talk about today. All we're going to talk about is a rectifier diode. The act of using a diode to turn AC into DC current is called rectification. So when you rectify voltage, that means you're turning it from AC into DC. You're only allowing it to flow in one direction. Now conversely, this is also a diode. And more accurately, this is two diodes. You notice there are two gray elements in here. These gray parts that you're seeing in this vacuum tube are the anodes. And the cathode, just like we learned about the cathode in the uh, the other tubes when we were wiring the filaments, there is also a filament in here that acts as a cathode. It actually heats the cathode area. And you can't really see it very easily from here, but you can see there's one wire going to one lead and one going to the other, and those are your cathodes. So this would be the same as having two of these. So there would be one, one would be here and one would be here. Now here's the cool thing, okay? We're not going to get into great details about how diodes work on a scientific level. I think that's a little too much for right now. But let's compare these two uh, and how much we've advanced. This is a Model 5U4 vacuum tube diode. Now. This tube, you can see how big it is, right? And this tube can handle about 1,500 volts reverse bias. What does that mean? Well, if you put the voltage on backwards, remember this is supposed to block the flow of current. So if you reverse the leads, the polarity, you can have up to 1,500 volts wired backwards in here and it will block all that voltage. It won't allow 1500. Now you get above 1500 and it can arc over and flash through and you will, it'll begin to conduct. And that's an arc and that's a bad thing. So as long as we have a transformer, a power transformer, that has less than 1500 volts peak, this would work. Now here's what's going to blow your mind. This is a 1N4007 diode. Now let's see if I can see it. Can you see it in there? I don't know if those numbers are showing up. There it is. 1N4007. And believe it or not, this diode can handle up to 1000 volts reverse voltage. So not quite as good as this one, but pretty close. And look how tiny. No comparison. Now, you might ask, well, this has to handle a lot more power, though. Well, this is rated at about, oh, I would say one amp. This, I just looked it up. This is good for one amp of current. So it can, it can take one amp of current before it overheats. Guess what this is rated at? You guessed it, one amp. Now that's where the similarities end. <laughs> In order for this to work, you also have to connect a 5 volt filament supply to heat the filament up. Now the vacuum tube's a little bit different. I'll draw you a schematic symbol of it. You have two anodes, because remember that there's two diodes inside of one tube. And then you have a filament. And this is the symbol for the filament. And from here to here, you put 5 volts. And then from there to there. And then from here, this goes to your cathode. So this is called a direct heated diode, meaning this filament is the cathode. So not only is it a filament, but it is a cathode. And that winding that you would have on the transformer to power this will also be elevated to whatever the B plus voltage is or the high voltage is 
going in to here. Now we don't need to connect both of these. If you just want to use it like a like the same as this 1N4001, you can just connect right on here and not use this one. You just connect to one anode. And what that's going to allow is it's going to allow electrons to flow from the cathode to this anode, like this. But if I reverse polarity between here and here, it will not allow the electrons to flow from the anode down to the cathode. So they can only go in one direction, just the same way as our silicon diode. Again, we're not going to get into super duper details today. Now here's the problem. When you look inside here, and you really can't without taking, you know, smashing the tube and taking it apart, there's actually a gap between this this gray area called the anode, this whole gray area, it's hollow inside. It's kind of like a piece of tubing or a channel. And the filament runs up in between there, and there's actually a space between that filament and this anode. And in order for these electrons to make that jump from the filament to the anode, you're going to have a little bit, you're going to have a voltage drop. Each different type of vacuum tube diode has a different characteristic for filament drop. And in this particular one, that voltage drop is going to be somewhere around 45 to 50 volts, depending on how many volts and how many amps are you, you are running through it. What that means is this is going to drop off about 45 volts. Uh, so if I have, let's say I put 450 volts up here, down here it's going to be 400 volts. So you lose voltage. This is something you need to take into consideration when you're designing an amplifier and designing a power supply because if you decide you want to use a vacuum tube rectifier, understand that the rectifier is going to drop voltage. When you compare that to this diode, this diode is only going to drop somewhere around 0.6 to 0.8 volts, less than one volt. Does that make sense? So it's less than one volt. So if I put 450 volts on this one, I'm going to have 449 0.4 volts there. Hardly any loss at all. That's why when you use a diode, you're going to have a much higher voltage on your power supply just right off the bat without taking anything else into consideration than when you use a vacuum tube supply. Another thing that vacuum tubes can do that, that diodes don't do as much is they can actually drop a little more voltage as you draw more current. So that that 400 and that 50, 45 volt drops or to 50 volt drop can be and I just noticed I said 45 volts and then I dropped 50 off of there. <laughs> Good grief. But as you increase the current and the voltage here, this could drop even lower than that. And that's called having a soft power supply. So all of these things, and this might be desirable, for instance, with a vacuum tube uh, guitar amplifier. Sometimes that's designed into the design where you want the power supply to, to give a little bit. And that helps the amplifier to break up and distort sooner. And that distortion is very desirable with an electric guitar. But when you're listening to music, uh, you know, audio, <laughs> you don't want that to happen. So you have to make sure you count that you compensate for that when you build your power supply and you take into consideration the amount of voltage drop and what's going to happen when this thing begins to, to uh, have to carry a big load. Not as much the case with these. Alright, so how do we measure this? Now to test the diode, you want a little bit of current to be able to flow through the diode to kind of break down that junction 
there there's two there's a junction between the silicon in here and there's they call it a p junction and an, an n junction and the p and n where they go together you have to have a little bit of current before you'll start to get that voltage drop there so these types of meters that are the most common now will have see this little symbol it looks like a diode right and it's not the same as ohms so this actually has about well it depends on the meter some meters only put out one and a half to two volts uh, in diode check mode some of them can go as high as 15 volts just depends on the meter. This one, I believe, goes to, uh, it puts out something like 4 or 4.5 volts, something like that. Maybe 6 volts. I don't remember. Anyway, the current's always going to flow conventional current, meaning we're, we're looking at the positive going towards the negative or the positive wanting to go to ground. We'll get into that maybe another video about conventional current versus uh, uh, electron flow. So your P lead always goes on the anode and your negative lead always goes on the cathode or on the stripe. And when we measure, current will now flow out of your meter through the diode and into the other terminal so it goes from in conventional flow it'll go from the positive through the diode and to the negative and you can see I'm dropping about 0.58 or just under 0.6 volts is being dropped across this all the rest of the voltage that we have is being absorbed by the meter and that's what this is checking is the voltage drop if I turn these leads around, I go reverse polarity. So I go, I put the red lead on the stripe and the black lead not on the stripe. You can see we get nothing. Now just like this has a peak reverse voltage that it can handle before it fails, so does this. Like I said, this one is a thousand volts. At 1000 volts, this diode will begin to conduct in the reverse direction. Now it will be at limited current at first, but as you go above a thousand volts it will it will start to convert all those volts above a thousand volts into heat until finally the diode will fail now there are some diodes that are specially designed with a specific reverse voltage and they're supposed to run in reverse voltage and those are called zener diodes and zener diodes or zener diodes however you want to pronounce it they actually want you to connect them backwards and they, they will have a voltage very specific to what you want to set it to. And you can use those diodes to regulate a voltage. So if I have a 12 volt power supply and I want to clamp it off at 10 volts, I can use a 10 volt Zener diode and put it in backwards, you know, wire it this way. And anything above 10 volts will get clipped off by that diode and conversely will be converted into heat. So just a little side note, that's the uh, Electronics 101 and a half. So pretty cool stuff. The diode will conduct in one direction and not the other. Now let's see what this looks like on an oscilloscope. All right, we have a pretty janky, unsafe setup here. How I wouldn't have it any other way, huh? But in all seriousness, anytime you're messing with higher uh, voltages, be careful. and don't always do what I do unless you really understand how these things work. If you're doing this at home, you're doing it at your own risk. I do this so you don't have to. This is just an experiment to show you how these things work. This is not how we would do things in real life. So here's my unsafe light bulb socket with exposed terminals and it's just connected to my Variac and I have the Variac set to about 50 volts AC so that this bulb doesn't blind you and get too bright. And I just have a uh, just a jumper plug going straight into the bulb. And when we turn it on, you can see that it the bulb lights up. Now, let's look at what it looks like on the scope first. Okay, now I'm connecting this up to the oscilloscope 
and I'm using a special probe called an active uh, differential probe or actually just a differential probe is a better way to put it and that allows me to isolate <laughs> the ground lead of my scope from everything else even though I am connected to an isolated power supply driving this so I'm really being cautious uh, more about that at another time that's a that's an oscilloscope video anyway if we turn this on we see the light lights up and if we look up at the oscilloscope you can see right there and we have about 49 volts RMS and, and remember I said 50 volts so there's about 49 volts RMS voltage and you can see the peak is going to be 1.414 times that we learned all that earlier right so you, we should all be experts at that now now let's see what happens if we put a diode in line with that so just so you know the very simple circuit we're having is we have our AC mains and I have it stepped down to about 50 volts correct RMS we learned about that earlier and it just goes straight into the bulb now what we're going to do is we're going to add one diode in series with the circuit so now the current can flow this direction through the bulb but when when the polarity changes because this is alternating current right the current cannot flow this way it'll be blocked what do you think is going to happen to the bulb well let's connect it I'm gonna take this jumper I'm gonna disconnect this one lead and I am essentially going to just put this diode right in series with the circuit and you can see right there we are and what I'm also going to do while I'm at it is I'm going to connect this just one end and you're not seeing anything I'm doing are you <laughs> I'm off camera so there you go so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this on here and I'm going to short this out and we're going to see first of all when we go through the diode so we've got this right now and then we're going to see what happens to the bulb when we short it out so let's turn it on and you can see the bulb is lit and if we short it out it gets brighter okay let's see if we can find out why it's doing that so right now the bulb is going is being fed through the diode and if we go up to our oscilloscope what do we see only half of the waveform do you notice that and if we adjust our trigger it'll stay still so this part of it is being clipped off now let me put that jumper on there and see and the bulb of course will get brighter and the reason it gets brighter is because now the whole signal is there now what this is called when we do this this is called half wave rectification now what do you think will happen if I move the if I flip the diode the other way so see what what it looks like right now okay I've shut off the power to everything so this is safe to touch I'm going to take this out and all I'm going to do is I'm going to take this diode flip it around this way I'm going to leave the oscilloscope and everything else connected the same way. All right. And I'll put my jumper on here. Well, I'm not even going to put the jumper because we don't need it. We know what that looks like. And let me go back up here. And let's turn the power back on. And look what happens. Let me set my trigger again. Now you see the positive going half cycle so when we had the diode in one way it was clipping off the negative or the positive half cycle and now we have the diode flip the other way and it's clipping off the negative half cycle but more importantly 
since you only have half of the waveform on there, this voltage is on, this current is only doing half the amount of work that it was before because it's only turned on half the time. Now, if I put my if I short out my diode again, so I'm going to do that right now. If I can get on it there, you can see that at all times, except for when we're doing the zero crossing here, there's always voltage. But when I have the diode in there, only when the volt when the current is flowing in one direction do you have any voltage at all. The other, for the rest of the time, it's just sitting there. So for this portion of the time when all the voltage is turned off, there's no current flowing, that light bulb is cooling off. That filament is not getting any heat. So the average of that filament being heated has been cut in half. And conversely, the bulb doesn't glow as brightly. So even with the camera that's that's automatically adjusting for that, if I touch this, you see that it gets brighter. And when I half wave it, it gets dimmer. And this is called half wave rectification. Now most small circuits, uh, a lot of small circuits, old ones, especially like the, the five tube uh, AM radios, you know, from the early days, a lot of times they call them AA5s or All-American 5 radios. This is exactly the way they work. They only have a half wave rectification. So the, you only have half of this, of this cycle feeding the radio with power. Now why don't we hear all kinds of hum and everything? Well, we'll get more into that later because that's not what this video is about. But this is how they do it. But what happens if I want to take advantage of all the power? Well, in order to do that, we have to do one of two things. So let's say we have our transformer and we have an out, our mains going in and we have our secondary coming out. Now, one way to handle this would be to take a transformer with a center tapped winding. We saw a center tap on our filament winding earlier in this series. But let's say we take this and we connect it to ground. We then take our diode and then we add another diode on this side. And then we connect them together. And then let's take our light bulb once again. And we connect one end here where the two cathodes connect together. We take the other side and we connect it right here. And you don't even need this here if you don't want it. And let me sh let's look at the current path. Okay, so first of all, we have current flow this way and current flow this way. So one half of the cycle, it's going this way. One half of the cycle, it's going this way. And the same thing's going on over here. So we'll have a loop going this way and a loop going this way. Make sense so far? However, with respect to the center tap, what's going to happen is when the voltage is going this way, okay, it comes down to here, it can make it through here, so it jumps through. It can't get up here, so it, it, it's blocked this direction, but it can go through here and return to this center tap. Now when the voltage, when the current reverses, the polarity reverses, and it goes this way, now the current can flow through this diode and it comes down to this side, it can't get through here, but it can once again go through the bulb. And the cool thing is, notice in both instances the current is always flowing in the same direction.
This is called a full wave rectifier because what you're going to find out is instead of seeing half of the waveform, then nothing for half, then another half, you are now going to see that. Let's build, the, let's take a look at that. Okay, I now have have it wired up like this. And I had to use this little transformer because this is the only one I have handy with a center tapped secondary. So we have our mains going in and we have 24 volts center tap. So there's going to be 12 volts from here to here and 12 volts from here to here. So really when it's rectified we're only going to have 12 volts RMS uh, or 12 volts rectified voltage. And I'm coming out of the two outer leads like this and I'm going through two diodes and you see my two diodes down here. And this yellow wire goes to one side of the bulb. Let's see if I can open up a little further. To this side of the bulb and to this one side of the scope. And then the other common of the scope goes also to the center tap right here which goes to the other side of the bulb. So I hope you can follow that. It's just like this schematic. And if we look up at the oscilloscope, and of course the light doesn't light up now because there's only 12 volts and that's not enough to heat the filament enough where it'll give off light. But it does put a load on it at least. And if we go in there and look at the scope, you can see we now have a full wave rectified signal. So where we used to have that space here where it was zero volts for half a cycle, we now have all of the cycles. So you might say to yourself, that's great, Tony, but what if we have a transformer that doesn't have a center tap? What if we want to rectify something that doesn't have a, a split rail like that or a center tapped secondary? So let's say we have a transformer like the one in our amplifier kit where you only have an untapped secondary. So how do we do this? We do it through the use of a bridge rectifier. And a bridge rectifier is going to use four diodes. And it's going to do a very similar thing to what the full wave rectifier did, except we're going to eliminate the need for that center tap. How? All right, I'll show you how. So let's pretend this is the plus and this is the minus. And we could have it either way, we don't care. When you draw a bridge rectifier, always make all the arrows point towards the plus. So if I go like this, and I go like this. Notice all my arrows are pointing towards the plus. And I go like this. And I go like this. So now the negatives are tied together and the positives are tied together and the junction where a positive and a negative on each side go together that's where we connect our AC. So this is AC here and AC here. Now how does it work? Well, when current is flowing in this direction, obviously it can't go through here because this diode will block in that direction. But it can go through here. So the current flows through here and out to here. And let's say we have our light bulb once again or our load right in here. And conversely, the current is flowing this way in this wire. That's how you get a loop. Well, we can bring the current path from here through the bulb, through this diode, because this one's going to block in the negative way, and right to here. When current flows the opposite direction and the polarity changes, the same thing will happen. Now this, this time, this diode will conduct in that direction through the bulb 
up through this diode and return to here. And these two diodes will be blocking. So you can see they alternate which ones block and which ones conduct. That's called a bridge rectifier or a full wave bridge rectifier. We all know who we're talking about, huh? Anyway, that's how this works. Now the only disadvantage to this is, notice, this has to go through two diodes before it gets, completes the circuit to this bulb. And those two diodes are just like they're in series. So you, each one has its 0.6 volt drop. So now your voltage drop is going to be about somewhere around 1.2 volts. So you'll have double. So you're still going to have very small voltage drop relative to, you know, to what it is. But if this is a low voltage power supply, let's say that you want to make a 12 volt supply and you have 12 volts RMS, right? Or 12.6. What's going to happen is that 1.2 volts of drop is going to, going to count for something, isn't it? And you may not get your full 12 volts DC because of that voltage drop. So it's just, again, a design consideration. So let's make a bridge rectifier. All right, to make the bridge, we take the first two diodes and we put the two cathodes together, or the two stripes. And you can see how I have them together and I twist them together. And then the other two diodes, I'm going to put the two non-striped sides together. So you can see that. And I'm going to twist them just like so. There we go. Come on and focus. So there they are. And then we're going to take the two open ends and we're just going to twist them together. So this side goes like this, and this side goes like this, just like that. And we have a full wave bridge rectifier. And where the two cathodes come together, that's your plus. Where the two anodes come together, that's your minus. And where there's a cathode and anode on each side, that is your AC. So if we take our AC mains and we connect it to the AC side, and I have this all turned off right now, just like so. And then we also connect, I'm going to turn this back down to 50 volts. And then we connect one wire from our minus okay, from our minus to our bulb. And remember bulbs are non-polarized, so it doesn't matter which direction you connect this through a light bulb unless it's an LED. But this is an incandescent bulb, so it really doesn't care which way it's connected. But other devices are polarized, and it does matter. So now we have the meter, or I mean we have the bulb connected to the plus and minus. So our bulb is right in here, just like we drew. And when we turn this on, you can see There is our voltage. It looks pretty bright. And take a look. And now the bulb has almost exactly the same brightness, or almost the same brightness, I should say, as that 50 volts made it light up when there was no bridge rectifier. OK, now that we got a general idea of how diodes can rectify AC into DC, let's talk about some of the different types of diodes. Now, the first thing I want to preface this with is that I am not going to get into all the different types of diodes like, you know, uh, 
Zener diodes and Schottky diodes and avalanche diodes and pin diodes and blah 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 on and on and on and on. We're just going to look at three different types of rectifier diodes. One is going to be a standard diode and it is a 1N4007 and that's the 1000 volt right peak reverse volt PRV at one amp. The next one is a BAT85 and I don't know the voltage on this but it's much lower voltage but it is a Schottky diode All right, and I think I spelled that wrong and then the next one is a UF1004, which is a ultra fast switching diode. And I'll put little notes up on the screen to make it easier than my chicken scratch writing. And this one, since it's a UF1004, instead of a thousand volts, it's rated, I believe, at 400 volts. There's also a UF1007 that will go up to um, that'll go up to a thousand volts. They're very similar, but there are some slight differences. It's also good at one amp. We'll talk about that a little bit after we do this little experiment. Now, I'm, this is not a good, a perfect example of what this does, but this will give us an idea of what's happening and I can build off of that after you see the results on the oscilloscope. So what we, what we have is a little schematic here of what we built. I have my signal generator and my signal generator can put out anywhere, we're going we're gonna to try a one kilohertz, a 100 kilohertz, and a 400 kilohertz signal. All right. And they're all at 4 volts, 4 volts RMS. Now, the reason I'm using this 4.7K resistor is because my signal generator is not capable of delivering much current. So, you really can't get uh, a very accurate, it, it will distort the signal because the signal generator itself has current limiting. It's, it's there for a purpose if you short something out. So I don't want that to have any effect on it, so this is 4.7K. Now, one thing I will talk about later is that this is important here. The amount of current flowing through these diodes will affect these signals and it will affect them in a similar way to what we're going to see. So that's what I want to build off of. All right, enough about the talking. Let's do the, let's do the demonstration. So as you can see, here is our 4.7K resistor, and I have these three diodes. They're all three tied together uh, going to this resistor, and then I can just connect the signal generator to whichever one we want to look at. And right now I have it connected to the standard 1N4007 diode right here. This one right here. So this is the one you use. It's a very common diode. You can buy these in, you know, these are the things you used to buy at Radio Shack and places like that very inexpensively. They're used everywhere and they're very common. So we're going to use that one first. And I have this this probe here is coming from the signal generator. This is actually injecting that signal into the anode of the diode. So that would be right here. This other probe goes out to channel two of the oscilloscope. So we can actually see the signal that's going into the diode right here. This other probe is going to channel one of the oscilloscope and it's actually looking right here across the load. So it's measuring across this resistor to see what this diode, how it's influencing that signal going into the resistor. 
So our first connection right now is through the 1N4001. And if we take you up here, and I have to turn the light off to get rid of the glare, I have it projected up to the monitor. Make sure I get this straightened out. And if you look, we have a pretty nice signal there. I think you can agree, it doesn't look too bad. And the blue signal up here, we can see, oh, I have something cool, hold on a second. You're gonna love this. <laughs> I got some new pointers, guys. I'm pretty excited. Okay, so this, how do you like this? These are my lightsaber chopstick pointers, and they light up. Oh. All right, small things for small minds. So here is the AC going into the diode, and here is what's coming out of the diode, and you can see it's a half-wave rectified signal. It looks perfect. Okay, let's move everything now over to the UF4001, which is the ultra-fast diode. And it really doesn't look any different, does it? It looks just the same. And if we move over to the Schottky diode, again, looks about the same. And a Schottky diode is a special diode that's made to be able to switch on and off very, very quickly. And an, a UF diode, or an ultra-fast switching diode, is also designed to switch on and off very, very quickly, but not to the same degree as a Schottky. There are other differences that I don't want to get into in this video because that's way too much. We can do an entire long video on <laughs> those types of diodes right there, but we're not going to do it today. This is just for our power supply to see why, because we I got questions on this, so we're going to see why we use certain diodes in our power supply. All right. With that in mind, let's go back over here to our 1N4007. And I am now going to go up to 100 kilohertz. And then I have to change the oscilloscope to display it. Wow! <laughs> what happened? So this is what's called diode recovery. And what's happening right now is this diode, as the voltage is dropping and then re going into reverse voltage, this diode at its junction between the P and the N material junction of the diode is holding a charge that's called a space charge. And what's happening right here, and I'm not going to get, there's a phrase called recombination, and we're not going to get into that, okay, when it recombines. But essentially, think of this diode as having a little capacitor in with it. And that little capacitor is charged up. That's, we're going to call that space charge. And what's happening is we're putting this reverse voltage on here more quickly than that charge can dissipate. So for this short little period of time, the diode will actually conduct in reverse. So you'll actually get reverse conduction or reverse biasing of this diode. And that's what you're seeing. And then all of a sudden that charge starts to bleed off and then it blocks again. And the higher the frequency we go, the worse this is going to get. You'll see that as, as we move on. Now let's move over to our ultra-fast diode. All right. And you see what happens right there. With the ultra-fast diode, there's just a tiny little bit of recovery there. See that? And this is called diode recovery. You see how that recovers? And that's an ultra-fast recovery diode. And you can see, you still have a little dip below the 
the zero volt range so it does go negative it does conduct in reverse for just a short while and then as it recovers it goes a little bit above and then it's happy but it's pretty good so even at 100 kilohertz this thing still acts like a rectifier now if we move over to our Schottky diode you can see once again there's a little bit of a slope here but it never dips negative at all and it's very flat across here until it goes to its next turn on period so you see it's even better than the ultra fast diode okay now I'm going to go up to 400 kilohertz. I'm going to stay on the Schottky diode for a minute. And I'm going to adjust my scope again so we can see. And once again, you can see this never goes negative, but now it's kind of the opposite. It takes this thing a little bit of time to turn off, but it does not allow it to conduct backwards. So you can see it's, it has like a, a pretty soft recovery to it, but it still keeps in the positive. Now, if we move over to the ultra fast diode, let's look at that. And you can see the ultra fast diode also has the little slope on the turn off but it also has a little delay on the turn on now. So when it starts to conduct, there's a delay. And when it goes to turn off, there's a little delay. But again, it really never goes negative. So this one has a turn off and a turn on delay. And the Schottky only has a little bit of a turn off delay, but not a problem with the turn on. Now let's go to our standard 1N4007 diode. <laughs> it's pretty bad, huh? So now it, it reverse biases. It stays reverse biased. And by the time this thing, before it even gets to the zero crossing, it's following this. So you can see, and the higher the frequency we go, the worse this is going to get. So, the moral of the story is, these standard diodes are not good at switching something on and off very quickly. Now, when we were looking at 1 kilohertz, and if we go all the way down to 60 hertz, so I'll do 60 hertz. And we adjust our scope. You can see it's beautiful. There's no problem at all. And that's why it really doesn't matter which one of these you use, as long as it can handle the current and the reverse voltage that, that, that you're going to be supplying it with from your power supply, you can get away with this 1N4007. Where you get into trouble, though, is any time there is high current. As we start increasing the current, and this is unfortunately not something I can do with my signal generator at different frequencies and so forth, but as you change the current through the diode, it will also begin to do that. And sometimes you'll even get a ringing where you'll see an oscillation that will kind of die taper off. And that oscillation is a lot worse on a standard speed diode than it is on an ultra fast or a Schottky diode. And because of that, you sometimes will see those little capacitors right across the diode. So let's go down here. So what they'll do is they'll take like a one nanofarad capacitor or something like that, and they'll put it right across the rectifier diode. Now this is for when the the diode is conducting very heavy current. So you'll see this on like some of the real high powered stereo amplifiers that are solid state. So for instance, uh, a Pioneer SX1050, you saw me work with, 
those before. Those have very high current power supplies. They're only, they only go up to about 60 or 70 volts, somewhere in that range, you know, less than 100 volts. But they, they can draw very heavy current. And when, when the capacitor bank is charging up, you can be up to 280 amps of surge current, of inrush current. And a lot of times when that happens, when that signal goes to do this, when it comes down, you'll get something that looks like that. You'll get like a, a noise spike like that. And by placing this diode across there, that helps to squelch the, or snubber that out a little bit. Now the trick is you don't want this, this does not work on, a, on low current. So when you're not drawing any current, what this actually does is it bypasses this diode and you'll get AC right here. So if I tried that on this really low current circuit, let me see if I have something here. Here is a, uh, what's this? This is a 10 nanofarad, okay? So this is a 10 nanofarad capacitor or a 0.01 microfarad. And let's see what happens if I put this capacitor across my diode. Not much, but you could see how it'll distort it a little bit. See that? See how it distorts it? I don't know if you can see that or not. And if I put a larger capacitor, it'll get even worse. See that? It's a little bit bigger cap. And if this were a high impedance circuit, instead of a, a 4.7K, let's say that was a 10K, it would get so bad that you would actually start seeing the AC sine wave on there. So it's a trade-off. So you will see those sometimes, uh, those capacitors on there, on real high current power supplies that may have a little bit of ringing problem on them and they'll do that to suppress that. But you could also just use high speed diodes. Now back in the day when they built those things, high speed switching diodes that could handle high current was not available. So for instance, we a real popular one was this 1N5408. See there? And these are these diodes are good for up to three amps and they have a forward surge current for a half cycle of over a hundred amps so these are really good for stereos uh, up to like you know 50 to 100 watt stereo these will work pretty well but now but they have come out with new ones and here is a UF5408 and here's some that I have in stock. And they're the same diode, but ultra fast switching with a soft recovery. So that soft recovery means that it'll have that little bit of taper to it as it drops off. And that little bit of taper will help to suppress any type of ringing that you might have. So you no longer need that capacitor across there. Now some of them, in some instances, maybe you will, but most of the cases with that, you won't need that with those ultra fast diodes. Okay, let's sum this up, what we learned in this lesson. We learned about what a diode is. We looked at an example of a vacuum tube diode. We learned a wee little tiny bit about that. We learned about solid state diodes, and there are different types of diode materials that they make. So for instance, the ones that we use the most today are made of silicon. And there's also older diodes that were made of germanium, and they have different characteristics. They track differently with current, and they have a lower forward voltage drop similar to a Schottky diode. We also have exotic ones like um, 
what are they, uh, silicon carbide, I believe they were, or glass silicon, I can't remember. Uh, but they, they are ultra fast switching, like they can work almost up into the microwave range. And uh, so we learned about those different types of diodes. And then we saw the differences between an ultra fast diode and a standard diode and how they can, as you, as you apply any type of high frequency component to that, that the diode can actually conduct in reverse if it isn't all the way turned off. So these diodes need a certain amount of time to, sh to turn on and to turn off. And if the frequency you're applying to them is faster than the frequency that this diode can turn off and turn on, the, the rise time and the fall time, you will see it uh, conduct in reverse bias. And we saw that on the, on the oscilloscope. And again, what I had was not a perfect example. To have a perfect example, we would want to put different frequencies at higher currents and look at it that way into a, you know, a lower resistance, lower impedance load and so forth. But I think this at least gave you a visual idea of what's happening in that diode. We learned a little bit about space charge, which is you actually have to have that little charge at the P and N junction of the diode before it turns on and then that charge has to dissipate before it fully turns off. Let's go back to our schematic now. Here is our diodes once again. And now that, now that we've done this video, we know this is a full wave bridge rectifier. So this bridge rectifier is, consists of four diodes. And this is a low powered high voltage amplifier. So since it's vacuum tubes, it uses high voltages at very low currents. And the surge current through these is not real high. It doesn't have a real high inrush and it doesn't have a real high surge current that you would see in a solid state amplifier. All those things. The, also, this is not RF. When you're, when you're dealing with like a RF transmitter, the final tubes in the final section or the outputs that drive the antenna, that's, we call those the finals, they can actually make very fast abrupt changes in current uh, depending on the load that they're driving and what frequency that you're transmitting at and so forth. And that, that can backfeed through this. These will have to supply higher and lower currents very, very quickly. More quickly than you would on a stereo amplifier that's, you know, 20 kilohertz is the highest frequency you're going to listen to. So those, you might want to see those little capacitors across there, or you would need to use ultra fast rectifiers, which we have today, but they didn't have back when they were building these things back in the 1950s and so forth. So what am I saying? Well, we really don't need capacitors across these diodes in this amplifier because it's such low power and there's such low surge current and the frequency is never going to exceed audio frequencies. So you're not going to have an abrupt change in this and the capacitor banks are going to filter a lot of that out, even the higher frequency components. And we'll get more into capacitors later. So none of this is really going to matter. It's not going to be a problem. So we are safe to use just standard diodes. Now, a 1N4007 would probably work in this. If you recall, a push-pull set of these 6P1s is only going to draw less than 100 milliamps at full power. And you have two amplifiers for stereo, so that would be 200 milliamps, and that is way less than the one amp that this 1N4001 can deliver. But because we want to be a little bit overkill, and because I have them in stock, I will probably use these 1N5408s, and these are three amp components. And even if something shorted out, you would probably blow the fuse long before these would ever be damaged. 
if you get a short circuit or something with these little 1N4007s, quite often the diode will short out before this fuse would blow. These are good for about 30 amps for one half of a cycle. So you can do a 30 amp surge for one half cycle before this thing will be destroyed. These are way higher than that, a magnitude of more than three times that they can handle. So if you get a short, like a capacitor shorts out or a vacuum tube shorts out or something, that fuse will blow before these will get damaged. And that's why I'm going to use these ones. Again, it's overkill and a lot of the cheap kit amplifiers come with the little dinky diodes, which are fine, they'll work. Uh, let's see if I can find the one that was with this. I think it's in here someplace. As I shuffle around looking for it. There it is. So this is a bridge rectifier. And all this is is a package that has all four diodes in one package. And you can see the four wires coming out. And they're internally connected inside here. And I don't even know what this one's rated at, but it's probably a, a, either a 1 amp or a 2 amp, something like that. It might be higher than that, I don't know. But since we're not using the circuit board, I'm going to use discrete components. I'll just use these, and it'll be just fine. All right, let's do our bridge rectifier now. And you can see how they're configured, and as I said earlier, the arrows all point towards the positive, and that's how we want to wire this up. Now I have the terminal strip, if you recall, we have that terminal strip in there, and we want to wire the diodes, they'll all be in a row, they won't be in a square like this. So, I just drew out four of the terminals for the four diodes, and just kind of mapped out the direction I want them to be, and if you notice, we have AC, and this will be the terminal on the far end. The next one over actually has a lug on it where it attaches to the chassis, so this will be our negative. And then the next one is going to be the other AC, and then the one on the far left is going to be our positive, which is going to be the output, and that's going to work because all the rest of the terminals on the terminal strip will be our resistors and so forth for our Pi network and for the different voltages that we need for the power supply. Okay, the first one I'm going to do is this one right here. And I'm just going to start by bending these leads. And I'm just going to go with these 1N5408s. I could have also used the UF5408s, but it's really not necessary. This amplifier is very low current, low power. Uh, the voltage isn't that high. It's not going to have any terribly reactive loads on it or anything like that so I just don't see the necessity to use the other diodes uh, it wouldn't hurt if you did it wouldn't matter but and some of you're gonna say well why don't you just do it if it doesn't matter and, well you know it doesn't matter and probably because it will annoy some of you <laughs> So I'm going to just bend these over and put them in like this. And I'm going to bend the legs up like so. And remember this first one, we want this, this one is going to the, to the lug for the chassis ground. And as I said earlier in the video, we really don't, have to worry about uh, using a chassis common ground on this. This is not a really super high impedance and super high gain amplifier. So you're just not going to need to have that kind of special grounding or anything, any exotic type grounding. We're just going to chassis ground everything. All right, the next one we're going to put is this one here. Again, the negative 
or the anode side there is going to go Try to get these straightened out as best I can. And just kind of get you, get the terminals nice. Then I'm going to tack solder this ground lug. And I'm not going to fill in the terminal yet because we are going to probably add another wire there for for ground let's see there we go and here we go you could tell these are new old stock terminals because they're not the solder isn't sticking real well to them so I'm going to have to heat them up a little more and maybe even put a little bit of flux on them. I probably should have cleaned them off a little bit. All right. And then we will trim them off. Just like so. And then we'll fill that in later. Now, this one we want to be like that. I'll do, do them. Just like soak all over the lens of the camera. Okay. Trim those up a little bit. And again, we're going to clean up these solder joints once we get everything in place and get all the wires on. I also took a couple of paint markers and I just marked white dots where the transformer windings go and a black dot for the ground and a red dot for the positive just to remind us. All right, our next connection is going to be this one right here. So again, it's going to be the same spacing. So we'll bend these in. And this will go like this. This is how we do point-to-point -point wiring. And everybody has their own way of doing things. And I think the main thing is making good, good joints with, uh, that have physical contact as well as good solder contacts. Just like that. this one we will fill in and again these holes down here are where our capacitors are going to be and yes we have not talked about capacitors yet in this series but we'll be getting to that next so there's that one and last but not least we have the one that goes clear from this side to this side and I'm going to put a piece of heat shrink over that just so that it doesn't so that it doesn't touch 
anything. These other ones are kind of out of the way, and this wire is so stiff it's not going to go anywhere. I'm not even going to put the heat gun on it and shrink it because as soon as this gets hot, when we solder it, it'll shrink. So no big deal. We just want to get this on here. Like so. And yes, this is a solder and talk. A lot of you like this, some of you don't. For those of you that like it, I'm glad to do it. For those of you who don't, hit the fast forward button. Simple as that. It amazes me how people complain about a video is too long or the, you waste your time on this. Dude, don't you know that like there's modern technology today? <laughs> it's a video, it's a recording, and you have full power over it. You can hit the fast forward button and skip through anything you want, anytime you want. You can come back to a video and pick up where you left off and finish watching it later. Um, just amazes me how people get so uptight over the stupidest, simplest little things and complain. But I guess that's just our nature, isn't it? I try not to worry about that. I just appreciate the fact that people make videos for me to watch and to learn from. And then I don't care how they do it. Do it their own way because the fact that they're doing it at all is a great benefit to me is how I look at it. And even if it isn't, then I just won't watch it. It's just one of those things. So I heard an interesting paradox story here that my one of my employees said. How many of you are familiar with the story of Pinocchio? Remember Pinocchio? He's the little wooden marionette puppet that uh, the toy maker Mr. Geppetto made and he came to life and the problem was every time he lied you know his nose would grow look it up if you don't if you're not familiar so here's the question Pinocchio walks up to Mr. Geppetto and he says Mr. Geppetto my nose is going to grow would his nose grow or not grow that's the question. Hmm. Maybe I'll say that his nose will grow. And the reason that I give for that is because I follow the science. <laughs> There it is. Of course, that thing's sticking up crooked because this part was down a little bit lower where I connected it. Oh well. And I put it in backwards. Nice! <laughs> you guys think I do this crap on purpose, don't you? All right. That's what you get for soldering and talking, huh? You think that's bad. You ought to see me walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> there we go. We're going to just take this one out and flip it around. And everything will be right in the world again. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're not paying for this? And to think people have actually asked to send their stereos here for me to fix. Good Lord. Okay. Bend that. And then this one, I'm just going to see if I can heat it up and unhook it. Just like that. And then I'll clean that off real quick. Clear a little bit of this off and then put it on the right way. 
dumbass. Unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go this direction. Hey, this is an opportunity. I see this as an opportunity to get this to look straighter when we put it on there. That's what it is. It's an opportunity. Can I get this up in there? There we go. Straighten it out. There it goes. Okay, I'll just hold that for the moment. Solder this side on. You know, where I live, we have a large community of Amish. Now, some of you in the United States, most of you are probably familiar with the Amish community, even though they may not live in your part of the country. Other, other countries may not be familiar with them, but they're a very, they're very simple people and they don't use a lot of technology and uh, you know they're mostly an agricultural group of people very nice people and uh, in the area here they have a quilt shop where they make handmade quilts you know for your bed and they're very beautiful they're very intricate the way they're made and they're all handmade so they're very desirable People come from miles around to make them. And believe it or not, they're, and they're a very faith-oriented people as well. And in each of their quilts, one little stitch will be incorrect. It'll be just a little bit flawed. There will be one little flaw in every one they make. And they do that because, as a sign, that only God is perfect. And that to remind them that they're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Everybody has makes mistakes. So, there. I did that on purpose, you see. I put that diode in backwards. Because I'm not perfect. All right. Here it is. All done. So, now we have our negative and our positive and our diodes are all wired up let's connect and uh, we'll put power to this and see if we can get our high voltage now our DC voltage okay we now have the oscilloscope and I'm actually again using the differential probe that has a times 100 setting on it and I have it connected up and let's turn on our power and we'll move up and see what we get. Okay, remember that there is no load on this, so it's going to be a little bit wonky. Let's turn it on and see what we get. And you can see the frequency. Oh, let me get my new pointer. The frequency down here is 120 hertz and the reason it's 120 hertz is it's counting all these pulses remember it's the 60 hertz full wave rectified so there's 120 pulses each second and you can see these are not going all the way down to zero volts they're staying up and that's because there's absolutely no load on there if we put a little resistor on there you'll see that drop down we're going to do that in a minute our maximum voltage right now is 364 volts peak. 
So that gives us, it's saying 266 volts RMS right now. And that's going to all change when we connect our capacitors and everything. So let's turn this off. I'm going to put a little resistor right across the positive and negative, And let's see what that does to our waveform. OK, I stuck a 100K resistor across there. And that's just enough, as you can see, to make the pulses go all the way down to 0 volts now. And there you have it. So looking at this, we have 364 volts uh, of, of uh, peak voltage. And we have about 258 volts RMS. Keep that in mind because this is all going to come into play when we finish the power supply. And it's going to affect what our total voltage is going to be. So kind of take a mental note of that. So that concludes the diode portion of this build. And as I said, some of the examples I used are, were very rudimentary. And I only, total, I only really scratched the surface of how many things there are to know about diodes and rectifiers in general. But this should give you an idea of what's going on and how it applies to our project that we're working on. So that's it. Until next time, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I look forward to the next part, which we're going to get into capacitors. And that'll probably be a longer video also, because even if I totally scratch the surface <laughs> with uh, capacitors, there's so much to know about them. And uh, I will try to just talk about the caps and stay out of all the controversy because, you know, like I said, people, people love their capacitors out there. I don't know. Never been such a big deal to me, but it is interesting. Anyway, we'll see you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.